Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're going to be talking about the edge of physics with Anil Ananthaswamy from New Scientist magazine. It's coming up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 41 for Monday, April 12th, 2010, taking it to the edge. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Welcome, everybody, to yet another hour. Episode 41, we're taking it to the edge. We're taking it to the edge of physics, actually, with Anil Ananthaswamy. He has written a book called The Edge of Physics. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to work at the top of a mountain in the clouds or at the bottom of a deep mine shaft or in Antarctica where it's freezing? And, and do science. Have you ever, ever thought what it would be like to do that? Well, Anil thought that and then said, I'm going to find out what it's like and I'm going to write a book about it. So he's been all over the world to the most extreme places on the planet in search of physics and understanding what scientists are doing out in these crazy places and, and what they're learning about our universe. So... Anil, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for driving here to, to Petaluma and coming out to the cottage. It's great to have you here in person. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. The Your drive was really nice. Good. It's not, it's not too shabby. It's a beautiful drive. It's a yeah. beautiful drive. Yeah. yeah. What was the first thing that you thought of that, um, that really triggered you to go to these oh. places, to come up with this idea for this book, to, to get out and and start traveling the world for science? Um, for, for a while, I had been actually thinking of writing a novel uh, and I uh, had started working on a novel which had physics at its heart. Mm -hmm. And I got stuck, pretty much, because I couldn't figure out the structure of the novel, the way it should be written. And around the same time, I became physics news editor for New Scientist. And mm -hmm. I came to Berkeley, to Stanford, to talk to uh, physicists to just uh, get an understanding of what's happening in physics so that I could do my job better. Mm -hmm. And it was during one of these conversations with a cosmologist at the very end of sort of our discussion, I suggest, I told him about this, um, you know, this idea of, uh, that I was thinking about of writing a novel, but also that I just wanted to travel to mountaintops and write about <laughs> telescopes. Right. And it was a kind of a harebrained idea which didn't have much meat on it. And he put this little uh, seed of an idea in my head saying that well you don't have to stop at mountaintops you can go to like you said uh, to deep underground mines or to Antarctica or to Siberia because there are physics experiments that are happening all over the place and they yeah. are literally and metaphorically at the ends of the earth and uh, that was that was the beginning of the idea that oh I could tell the story of what's happening in cosmology um, but as a travelogue so that I could go to these places and report back firsthand about the kind of physics that's happening um, really at the very ends of the earth. What was the first place that you went? The first place was Chile, uh, very, very high in the Atacama Desert in mm -hmm. the Chilean Andes. And uh, I must say it was a very surreal experience because uh, uh, Chile is an ex that part of Chile is very, very dry. The Atacama Desert is mm -hmm. pretty much the driest part of the planet it hasn't rained there for decades some of some of the parts uh, of the desert and uh, I flew into Santiago from all the way from London mm -hmm. which was a long long flight and then from there another flight to Antofagasta which is on the coast up uh, towards the middle part of this long sliver of a country uh, yeah. and from there another two hours of driving into the desert and you travel through landscape that's just brown, endless brown, uh, you know, not a blade of grass, n no sign of life. And, and you get up into these mountains and suddenly um, 
uh, someone else had described looking at the picture that's on the cover of my book and saying that it looks like and and that particular telescope that I went to see in Chile is on the cover it looks like some little city magical city in the middle of this completely <laughs> brown um litany of hills uh it just pops out of nowhere it does just emerge it's it's not a city it's just four telescopes but and astronomers live there but yeah. it's uh it's an extraordinary place what 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 went into um what you were as you were planning your trip what went into your planning into your preparation into putting together everything that you needed for not just journeying and adventuring but also being able to record the stories that you wanted to to then tell people well the, the first thing i had to do was uh figure out which of these experiments i had to visit because i sort of had to pick experiments that if when they were put together i could then tell the story of physics yeah uh, so the first first thing i had to do was find out okay which of these experiments are the most important ones and can they all tell me bits and pieces of the bigger puzzle mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and that was step 1 but then i was also looking for really extreme places in a very deliberate fashion because i felt like part of what i wanted to convey uh, was to uh, the magic of physics but by using a proxy the, the the landscape the the people who are doing these works yeah and uh, so uh, there was a lot of thought that went into selecting the sites just based on some of the wonderful locations that they were being done in so siberia and chile and of course antarctica and things like that so it wasn't hard to do i mean they they are being done in some pretty amazing places there there are i mean you look at some i mean and it's physics mostly i mean there are people yes biology and and anthropology cultural yes. studies um paleontology you know people mm. are going scientists are going all over the world but and exploring and adventuring and there's there's definitely that adventure story yep. that lies at the heart of so much of science but I, physics is so incredible in terms of the way it just make creating these giant telescopes or you know putting a, a structure at the bottom of a mine shaft i mean yep. it, it's unbelievable i they mean they come up would, with these ideas yeah you wouldn't think that physics would be done at these places but it turns out that uh most of our listeners would know of the large hadron collider which made mm-hmm. big news just a couple of days ago yeah, that's they, a that's a gigantic machine and and yes i know, like yay 7 what is, is, is 7 trillion or electron yeah, volts 7 yeah, te- tera electron volts tera electron yeah. volts yes. exactly that they and they've actually got some data coming out of it it's so yeah, exciting yeah it is amazing and and that uh, experiment is an is sort of an example of how extreme physics has become mm-hmm. in terms of the experiments and that's because a lot of the questions we are trying to answer in physics have become very difficult and uh you know need experiments that uh just get bigger and more sophisticated yeah and not just that they can't really be done in your average lab in a university anymore uh you need very very quiet environments where there's no light pollution no radio wave pollution you need gigantic bodies of clear water or or huge amounts of ice or or you know um Uh, the ability to launch balloons that stay up aloft for long periods and all of these happen to be very extreme locations and uh, they the physicists have had no problems with that they track over all over the globe to do these things yeah do you think that these the physicists who do this are are they self selecting i mean are are they after the physics or do you think there's a heart of an adventurer in in the people who actually end up in these places i'm sure there's a bit of both uh, some of the physicists i met are uh, you know they are definitely driven by their desire to understand yeah. uh, you know the underpinnings of nature so that's there yeah but the breed of physicist i met are experimentalists so these are not pe- people sitting with a paper and pencil in their office and coming up with theories their 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 mindset is something very different they they are willing to work for 30 years on one experiment knowing fully well that at the end of it what they're looking for might not exist <laughs> and uh, which is it just uh, is amazing yes it's amazing it is and uh, so 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 they are i think in in a certain way adventurous and mm-hmm. uh, in a way that most of us find it really hard to understand why would you spend so much time but they they typify a, a very dogged breed of people right a breed of people who's willing to uh take an idea and stick with it who are willing to like the early adventurers who were looking for the edge of the earth yeah. you know to who the first people to sail around 
yeah. around the earth. Um, they're looking for something much bigger than they were, and they were willing to spend the time yeah. to do that. And and that uh, was brought home to me in Antarctica because Antarctica, you know, is a very new continent for us. It's mm. it's it's only about a hundred years ago that Robert Scott and Shackleton and others just you know made it to the South Pole. Well, Shackleton didn't, yeah. but Robert Scott did, and so did Amundsen, and. When you go to Antarctica, uh, to the U.S. base at McMurdo, the, the history of these explorers is all around you. The huts that they built, the, their last meal that's still lying, uh, you know, in the pots and pans that they were using, the, the seal or the dog they had killed for some reason, the, the meat is just lying there because it's so cold, nothing is thawed yet. <laughs> and, and, There's uh, no deterioration. Yes. And you read stories about these people just 100 years ago and, and the kind of things they did to get to the South Pole, for instance. But juxtaposed with that is the modern effort which is of science in in antarctica and mm -hmm. these people are just doing just as amazing uh work uh of a different kind and asking very different questions but uh it is they, they do typify that breed uh, what was uh, okay two questions um i guess i'll get to this get to them one at a time <laughs> sometimes i get ahead of myself i want to ask the questions all at once do you think that you found an adventurer in yourself? Do you did are you are you hungering for more adventure in the world since starting this voyage and like going to all these different places? Um, are you are you glad you've done it, but you're done? Like, what are, where do you sit now? Oh, I'm very glad I've done it. In fact, I look back at the travels. Uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a couple of years since the last travel, and mm -hmm. I look back at them and think that it was all a dream because. All these play, all these trips happened within about three years. Mm -hmm. I, I literally went to all continents, at least stepped foot on all continents. And um, uh, do I feel like I want to go back? Um, I I would love to go back to many of these places. In fact, almost every place was very special: Chile, Siberia, um, and I would feel emotional, uh, sort of leaving each place. But at the back of my mind, there was always this knowledge that if I had the time and money, I could come back. Right. Except for the South Pole. When I was leaving the South Pole, I think I had tears in my eyes because I knew that this was it. This I could possibly never get back there again. Wow. Because it's so difficult to get there. And you have to have all the stars aligned to, for you to make it there. And mine did for, for a brief period. And, mm -hmm. uh, I just got and goosebumps. at the South Pole, I was just, I was, I think I was, you know, in tears. Well, not, not totally, but yes. Was was the South Pole um, your favorite experience, or what would you say your, you know, in terms of the trips you took, what was the the most impactive to you? The most impactful would have been Antarctica, and I hesitate to say South Pole, just the South Pole, only because yeah. Antarctica itself, uh, you land at McMurdo, which is on the coast, and it's the coast that's the most dramatic. Uh, it, that's where you get a sense of the just how surreal the continent is. There's nothing that we encounter in daily life, especially mm -hmm. someone like me who's grown up in a warm country like India, yeah. um, to see the ice. Uh, I mean, maybe someone from Minnesota wouldn't... Uh, <laughs> wouldn't like, bat an eyelash, bat an eyelash. right? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but for me, just you know, looking at this vast expanse of ice and volcanoes, active volcanoes that are about... 12,000, 13,000 feet are high, rising just straight off, you know, from the coast. And uh, so cold that at the top you can see steam coming out and yet there are glaciers on the top at 12,000 feet. Um, so Antarctica was very profound. And, uh, and then South Pole, oddly, is featureless. It's just ice. It's flat. You, and you find it based on GPS or yes. Well, now, <laughs> now well, they can they can monitor the uh, sun and figure out that you're at the South Pole. But that's what people like Robert Scott and Amundsen would have done. And now, of yeah. course, they have GPS and they can tell. <laughs> Wait, um, we can do something without technology? What? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. um, but but this, I think the South Pole was. Um, I was for about ten days that I was at the pole. I was struggling to get a sense of the immensity of that place because it is very very flat and but it's at a high altitude it's about 9000 feet of ice you're standing on 9000 feet of ice but and each, any direction you look it's just ice ice and more mm -hmm. ice and the last day i decided to just take a walk along the runway so the runway is just a strip of 
compacted ice, ice right? Exactly. So <laughs> more that, ice. Yeah, it's more ice, but it's fl- it's relatively uh, firm because you know they they compact it so that the planes can land on skis. And I walked away for about uh, oh I don't know a couple of miles and got away from the South Pole Station, which is actually you know the the sense of people and population is very strong at the South Pole Station. Mm-hmm. There's all this construction going on, so. The moment I walked away, I realized that the thing about the South Pole was that it actually made you really aware of your own self because it doesn't seem to offer you anything in terms of relief. There are no mountains, no seas. It just sort of stares at you in the face and you stare back and eventually you realize that it's making you confront yourself. And that was a very profound moment. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. But it was, I could imagine then what must have happened to these explorers who spend days and weeks and months on the ice and all they had finally was to look within themselves it would have forced them to do so that's yeah that's got to be just an amazing moment that so many people never have the opportunity to to face up to themselves that way we're constantly surrounded by the cities the towns the if we even if we go out into nature there's usually yeah there are hills, there are fields, there are mountains, there's, yeah. there's stuff. There's stuff. There is stuff. Yeah. And, and, and there's sound also. Yeah. So to go someplace where there's ice and silence and... That's what it was, ice and silence. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, and that was the beginning of this understanding that uh, silence is actually really important for physics, which took me a while to figure out, but... Uh, how, how is that? Well... Because not not silence in terms of sound, mm-hmm. but they need silence in terms of uh, uh, light. Like so there shouldn't be any light pollution for telescopes. That's a kind of silence. Right. Radio telescopes. Get rid of the electromagnetic yes. interference. Yes. So it's a different kind of silence that they need, and they also need silence from for certain experiments. They have to go deep into mines because mm-hmm. the surface of the Earth is really noisy for such experiments. There are lots of uh, cosmic rays and radioactivity, even our bodies are radioactive enough for it to be noisy for them. Mm-hmm. So they have to go deep into the earth for that kind of silence. And without that silence, their instruments would not work. And uh, so that that was, I think for me, another sort of revelation uh, standing at these places, especially the last last trip, which was in the Indian Himalayas. I was standing on a peak where the telescope was and right across, just literally about a kilometer, about a mile mm-hmm. or two in front, was another hill with a 400-year-old Buddhist monastery. And it, that, to me, was the juxtaposition was just so beautiful. On one hill, you have telescopes, right. which need a kind of silence. And on the other hill are the monks, who also need a kind of silence for what <laughs> they are doing. And um, it, it was very... That, that was another profound moment. And I've got a, a picture here, actually. I'm going to going to bring up so you have uh, oh. on, on your website a, a photo journey and you have um, this is the Mount Wilson Observatory in Cali- in Southern California outside of Los Angeles outside of Pasadena 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 yes. right yeah. um, and I've, I've been there it's you have yes. I've been there yeah it's a it's a lovely place but it's not so not so distant as some of these other places no, that you might. <laughs> no, and you know, Mount Wilson would have been extreme at some point a hundred years ago. That particular chapter is uh, a chapter about the history of cosmology. That's where Edwin Hubble did all his work and figured out that our universe is much more than the Milky Way, mm-hmm. that there are galaxies outside the Milky Way and that they're all rushing away from us. That yeah. was our first intimations of a Big Bang. And... Uh, Here's another. Moving on from the Big Bang, we had the formation of of galaxies, like the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, And in this chapter, you went into the abandoned mine shaft, which I've read about, and I've just been. How many feet below ground is the is the Uh, mine shaft? Half half a mile underground. Half a mile, and here's a picture of um, the elevator. yeah. Is some of this stuff relatively old or is it's it... It's all very old. So the mine, mine... It's a dangerous little elevator. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they are, they keep it safe, but it is a very scary ride. It takes about three minutes to go all the way down. Uh, and this mine was uh, first uh, um, started... Well, the mine started in the in 1880s and it continued uh, being mined until the 1960s and then they shut it because 
I think it was economically not viable. Right. But uh, then uh, about 20 years ago, the physicists decided that they could we use... We can use yeah, this. Yeah, we can use it. And uh, thankfully, the, the, the miners uh, have left behind a wonderful uh, lift or elevator that mm-hmm. goes down, all the way down to the 27th level and, and the hoist that can uh, get this cage out. Right. And, uh, and the physicists just... That's the only mode of transport. That cage that you saw is the only... Uh, you know, where you can get in and, out. in and out. There are no stairs. No. So this particular picture is uh, a drift tunnel. At the, when you get down to the 27th level, and to you, if you look to your left, uh, when you get out of the cage, you see a drift tunnel. This is the tunnel that the miners would have used to bring ore to the cage and take it up. And then, you know, we went in further in uh, to... So that's into uh, the darkness. Into the darkness. We were actually standing inside one of the caverns that had been excavated by the miners many, many decades ago, and it's these gigantic holes in the rock that are left behind. And the guide, our guide, was showing us how little light the miners worked with. This was the kind of they would they work literally in candlelight. And then you turn. That's a that's a lunch room that the miners left behind with all their stuff <laughs> still there. Still there. They oh, just yeah. left it. Yeah. yeah. Probably some of the stuff, yeah, we don't need that. We're not coming back again. And the astonishing thing is that when you turn right from the cage, as soon as you get out of the the, the cage, this is what you're confronted with. This is the modern lab. Wow. Yeah, it goes from looking very basic and dark and, yeah, yeah, and And suddenly it's very modern. (laughs) It is very, very modern. There's there's thousands of tons of equipment there. And that's a a wonderful mural that... uh, that celebrates particle physics that's been painted inside uh, in, inside the lab. And in my mind, this is uh, a modern-day cave painting. So if some explorer someday, you know, someday uh, wandered into this mine when it was all you know, defunct again and, no one, and they explored the cave and found this painting, it would be our version of a cave painting. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, because if, if, it, it would be preserved down there. I would, I would imagine it would be preserved. And, yeah. yeah. So these are just some pictures of uh, the experiments that are looking for dark matter. Uh, so as pictures, they're not terribly interesting, but the experiment <laughs> is quite incredible. Um, this is the hoist that's used to bring the cage up. and you know, or, Some serious uh, gears there. Yes. <laughs> that's good. I like yes. seeing that. Yeah. Um, and we also had a video that you wanted, that you, that you thought would be good to show, that I think would be, um, would be fun to show. Um, and so what is it that we are about to see? So this, uh, this is an experiment that I went to see in Antarctica. So at uh, near McMurdo Station uh, in Antarctica, they okay, have the experiments. This balloon. is a balloon launch. This is a long duration balloon launch. That, uh, used to get experiments up into the sky. So you can see this giant helium filled balloon, which is about to lift off. And the, the helium, because it's so cold, is very, very compressed in volume. And by the time it reaches about uh, an altitude of 30, 40 kilometers, it's going to expand to about 40 million cubic feet. And the balloon is going to be 400 feet across. 400 feet, because it'll just expand it'll and expand. Just, the helium and will expand. And as the is, pressure decreases, yes, as, we, and, as and it and gets higher. The temperature higher. changes, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And so th- that looked like a pretty complicated box that they were... They were launching, they were launching. Uh, yeah, they were, that particular that? experiment w- was going to study cosmic rays. Uh, so they have to get above Earth's atmosphere in order to study cosmic rays properly. Uh, and uh, this particular experiment would have gone around the South Pole for about two weeks. And uh, then it would have been brought down. Um, you know, so retrieval of the experiment itself is connected to the balloon uh, by a parachute. And then the, there's an explosive that they can detonate at any time. Uh, at any time. And uh, once they detonate the explosive, the experiment free falls and then a parachute opens up. And the idea is that they can bring it up, bring it down on land somewhere near where they are. It usually falls in some very, very harsh parts of Antarctica and in massive crevasse fields or... <laughs> and then they have to go find it. Then they have to go find it. And uh, <laughs> they, they can probably, they can locate it because it probably has, uh, you know, transponders and GPS and all that stuff. So they know where it, where it has fallen. But... Actually, getting to it is not easy at all. There was one particular experiment uh, when it landed in a giant field of crevasses, and uh, they had to take two very, very expert skiers and rope them up so that if one of them fell into a crevasse, the other could pull the first skier out. And these two had to ski together for about 30 miles. 
and wow. then get the experiment out, the data, and then ski back. And ski back. Yeah. And that's that was one of the easier recoveries. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. There, <laughs> the things one. that the things that must be done for science. It is crazy. And especially this this experiment. There's one more uh, incident where the parachute is supposed to separate from the payload just as soon as the thing lands on on the ice yeah and in one instant it didn't separate and the the winds were blowing at about 10 knots so the this huge parachute was Is essentially it? open blowing around on on the surface and dragging this experiment yep. with it and the scientists had to fly in a small plane land near the near the experiment where it was just fluttering around and they would land and run towards the experiment to cut the parachute but then the winds would change direction and the whole thing would come at them <laughs> and they would have to run back get onto their plane and fly 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 over it again and come back in from another direction and eventually they managed to snag it but you know these are dangerous things they do the, yeah that it is it sounds very dangerous i mean it antarctica sounds like it would be one of the the more dangerous places that where it's um the the conditions aren't really they're the unpredictable yeah. where the the weather can change yeah. um where you know you, you're just not dealing with california that kind of weather yeah. yeah um now you went also to lake baikal um lake baikal is the deepest yeah. lake in the world uh and i personally i i have a fascination with all things russian and I, so Siberia, um, I had a, I, I had a professor I worked for who did his postgraduate training, his postdoctoral research in Siberia. Mm. Um, and so he had lots of great stories of, of the Siberian tundra. What were you doing? What were they doing with, in, in the lake? What are they using this, this deep lake for? So this particular experiment, the, the Russians are looking for something called neutrinos. Neutrinos are subatomic particles that, mm. uh, pretty much will go right through matter. Uh, they don't interact with matter much at all. Uh, so if you were to hold out your hand, mm -hmm. about a trillion neutrinos will pass through your hand, which are coming from the sun. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Here, and, I'm, I'm, I'm catching neutrinos. <laughs> so the idea, the idea is that the, the only way to really catch them or see them uh, is if they were to hit the nucleus of an atom directly. And, uh, mm -hmm. and if they were to hit a nucleus of water, then there's, there's a blue light that's produced and if they can if they can watch for this blue light and study the properties of this blue light then they can understand where these neutrinos are coming from what their energy is and things like that we've detected neutrinos from the sun and uh, you know from the atmosphere and things like that but mm -hmm. they're really interested in neutrinos from outer space right the, and they're really high the, the high the energy high ones. energy yeah. neutrinos and yeah. what and but there are very very few high energy neutrinos so the, their numbers start falling as their energy goes up so you start you, you, so the only way to have any chance of finding one of these is to monitor really large volumes of some material like water or ice and 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 the best place is something like Lake Baikal so what they're doing is they essentially have detectors that are submerged a mile un, under the surface to look for this blue light that would come out when a neutrino hits a water molecule that's what they're doing and they've built this telescope which they call the Lake Baikal Neutrino Telescope which is just deep under it's just the deep. So essentially imagine you're looking for this blue light. So you're looking at it uh, using detectors, which are like artificial eyes. Mm -hmm. So and the they, photo, what they call photo multipliers. Exactly. And, yeah, so right. photo multiplier tubes, the exact, the sort of the opposite of a television tube. So mm -hmm. in a television tube, you would supply electricity, you get out light. And these photo multiplier tubes, the opposite is happening. You, they, they see light and give you an electrical signal. And they have 228 of these artificial eyes that are, Submerged deep submerged. inside Lake Baikal, yeah. Is the is and I and I'm imagining that during the winter, especially, there's it just is it just still? Is there a lot of um, upwelling? Does it have no, a lot of no, water movement? Is that why it makes such a good place for a telescope? So, uh, so it, the winter has to do more with the uh, the financial situation of the mm. Russian scientists. So, um, <laughs> because uh, in order to actually build this telescope and uh, maintain it and all that. If they were to be doing it in summer when, when the lake is not frozen or in autumn, then they would need ships to sort of, you know, float on the water and they would need submersibles to go down and uh, wire up the instruments and things like that. And they don't, they haven't had the money ever right. since the Soviet Union fell. They've had a really uh, big shortage of funds. And they've come up with this really ingenious idea of how to do this on the cheap. 
I think so, physicists and um, computer IT specialists are probably the <laughs> <laughs> computer engineers, probably the best at doing things on the cheap. Yes, yes. And, <laughs> and, and, and the Russians especially so, yeah, I think. Yeah. And they, so they, what they do is they wait for Lake Baikal to completely freeze over. And then, and then they essentially establish an ice camp on top of the lake exactly where their experiment is. They cut holes in the ice and they yeah. will send a diver into this freezing water and try to get the experiment, the, the telescope out of the water, do all their maintenance, repairs and everything. And then they have to put it back, wire it up again mm -hmm. and get out before the ice melts because they are standing on a mile deep lake. Uh, and, yeah, you don't uh, want to fall in. You don't want to fall in. So when I, when, I called, <laughs> when I called them up and said, I want to come and see your experiment, they said, of course you can come, but you have to come in winter because that's the only time you work there. So wow, and so that that in itself that must that in itself must have had um, some crazy preparations that you had to do to be able to yes. to get ready for the Siberian winter. I mean, it was it comparable. You've been to probably two of the coldest places, Siberia in the winter and Antarctica. Comparable? Um, it, it, um, yes and I, no. Actually, <laughs> no, because uh, Antarctica gets much much colder. Much colder. South Pole, yeah. So South Pole is unimaginably cold. In in uh, in summer, with wind chill, it was minus forty. So and that's summer. Uh, Siberia was not that bad in uh, even in winter. In the winter, yeah, yeah. But, but remember, I was in southern Siberia. So if you were to head to northern Siberia, that's probably going to be really bad. <laughs> probably comparable to the South Pole. Which one did you do first? Which one did you? I went to? to I went to Lake Baikal first. And talking about preparation, I was actually not really well prepared because. Uh, uh, at the very last minute, I realized I hadn't brought, bought proper shoes oh, to no. go. And the very morning before my flight, I just picked up my leather shoes and came to the lake. And, of course, the experiment is being done on a frozen lake, and they're walking all over the lake on this ice. And uh, the German scientist who was my host, he looks at me and says, you've come to Lake Baikal in the winter in European summer shoes. <laughs> and he was both laughing his head off and... I think upset at me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was probably shaking his head, going, yeah. what is happening here? Yeah, so that was a big lesson, not to, you know, uh, to be serious about these places. Yeah. What other places have you been that you, that, you know, we, the cold places, the deep places, what, where else have you been? Um, the very hot places. I went to see uh, a place in South Africa, deep inside South Africa, which is just south of mm -hmm. the Kalahari Desert. And that's a... Uh, uh, a gigantic piece of land called the Karoo, which makes up about 40% of South Africa's landmass, but it's empty, it's empty completely. And uh, it's one of two places in the world that have been selected as possible sites for something called the Square Kilometer Array. That's going to be the largest radio telescope ever built. So wow. they haven't chosen between South Africa and Australia yet. So it could either be in the Australian outback or um, in this very arid part of South Africa. And again, it has to be some place that is fairly quiet. Yes, extremely quiet. Quiet yeah. in, this, uh, in this case pertaining specifically to radio waves. So yeah. telephone, um, so, um, mobile phone transmissions, television transmissions, even communications from aircraft down to ground control, those kind of things can be really bad for radio telescopes. So they have to find something that's accessible mm -hmm. because you have to get there but also completely silent or as silent as you can get. How long did it take you to get you? Did you fly, you, you flew into, into South Africa, like I went to into Cape jo Town and yeah. then, and then how long did it, did uh, that from trip take Cape you? Town, it was an eight hour drive into the desert. Uh, so, um, I first, it was, we, we drove from Cape Town to a place called Sutherland where there's a massive optical telescope stayed there overnight. And then from there, one of the South African scientists picked me up and then drove me further deep into the Karoo. I was completely in his hands by then. I didn't know where we were going. And, uh, but, uh, <laughs> you just have to trust. I was I completely trust trusting him. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a long, long ride. And there is, you know, you see someone once every couple of hours. There's nothing there. It's just empty. Uh, and there are farmers, I mean, but you don't see their farms and uh, they're gigantic farms and each sort of, they, they require something like a few acres of land just for one sheep. Right. Uh, it's that barren. So you need a lot of land, lot of so land that for there's grazing. right. Yeah. So there, there's, there's. I'm just looking at these pictures of the of the. Uh, oh, there you go. Yes. Of the Karoo. So that's the Karoo. That's actually if South Africa gets to build the square kilometer array, 
the center of the telescope will be exactly at that location. That's someone's farm that they've bought and decided that that's going to be the heart of the telescope. <laughs> but they've bought the land e even not knowing whether or not they're going to be placing yes, so, the actual so they're, telescope they're, array there. They're building their own uh, telescope anyway. So they're building oh. a gigantic radio telescope, uh, which are going to be the precursors to the, to the bigger one. If they don't get the contract, to build it in South Africa, then they will at least have their telescope. But if uh, if the bigger contract comes through, then the smaller one will just get subsumed by the bigger one. And this uh, this large, do you know the, the square kilometer array? What specifically is that going to be um, be decoding? It's radio radio waves, but specifically, what are they what are they looking for with making it that much bigger? So the idea is, uh, um, at, at least for the for the book, uh, I was interested in the implications of this telescope for cosmology. How do mm -hmm. you study uh, faint galaxies? Now, as it turns out, uh, galaxies formed from hydrogen, uh, and uh, and hydrogen can emit a radio signal, very faint, uh, and uh, these radio telescopes can pick up the radio waves from hydrogen in the in the universe. Wow! So if you if you're looking for galaxies using optical telescopes you're trying to look for the light from these galaxies mm -hmm. but they get fainter and fainter and it's very hard to find galaxies using optical telescopes as you go further back in time right but you can if you have a large enough radio telescope pick up the radio signals from the hydrogen gas that that should still be there as part of the galaxy so a lot of the gas that led to the formation of the original galaxy would still be around and going around and around in the galaxy and they mm -hmm. should be able to pick up the radio waves from these uh, hydrogen atoms and they're not uh, and, and the way that light uh, becomes uh, I guess dimmer as yeah. you as you go further back that that doesn't happen the same way with it hydrogen would, it would, but uh, but the thing is that you can build much bigger radio telescopes than you can build optical an optical telescope, telescope. so, okay, so in that it. sense even though the signals are faint your instruments can be much more sensitive so you can't that's imagine neat. building a square kilometer optical telescope and the square kilometer here refers to the surface area of the telescope, which is made up of 3,000 dishes, so antennas. If you, if you add up the surface area of all the 3,000 antennas, you get a square kilometer. That's very, that's almost impossible to do with optical telescopes. Right. Just looking at some more of these, of these images. You went, you did go to CERN. I did, yes. You went to CERN. Yeah. Now, the LHC, I mean, uh, how long ago did you did you visit? I I went there when it was still being constructed, so I could actually go inside and uh, wander around the tunnels and the caverns, and uh, so they were very nice. They showed me around quite a bit. And it's it's huge. It is huge. It's a twenty-seven kilometer long tunnel, circular tunnel, and uh, then uh, at four points uh, along this tunnel, there are massive caverns where the actual experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, are being built or have been built. Right. So uh, these caverns are literally 300 feet underground, and they are so massive. You can go into one of the caverns that uh, that you can see the picture there, um, and that's just the shaft looking into the cavern from the top. The shaft itself is about uh, oh 200 feet long, and then inside below that is the cavern where the experiment is being built, and uh, that's the Atlas experiment. So the, this this experiment is one of the experiments that's going to look for new particles. Mm -hmm. So so uh, these proton beams that we were talking about, the seven tera electron volts, those proton beams are going clockwise and counterclockwise al mm -hmm. along the tunnel, and they collide at four points of the tunnel. And at each of these points, they have to build an experiment to analyze the debris of this collision. Yeah, I and that's where this one of these experiments is. I like to I like to think of it kind of as a um as a like a car crash like if you have two race cars going around a yeah. racetrack and then they crash head into each other yeah. so if you if you had you know toy cars little electric cars that you could spin around a little mi mini racetrack and then yeah. the the springs the and the bolts the, yeah. and the the yeah. tire goes bouncing off in one direction and yeah. <laughs> you have you have the debris just like you you're talking debris. about and then you can find you can look for those little pieces yeah. what are the what are the little tiny pieces that make up the debris and is there anything in there that we don't know and that's the big question uh, so yeah. uh, the 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 one difference between that analogy of two cars crashing and this debris uh, coming off in the form of springs we're still talking of them as constituents of those cars. Right. right? Now, what happens with protons is when these pro high-energy protons collide, they just completely uh, become a ball of energy. 
Mm-hmm. It's pure energy, and from that energy, you get these other particles that uh, that just pop out, and then they decay into the particles that we know of, like electrons and photons and things like that. And by analyzing what comes out from that ball of energy, mm-hmm. you can start understanding what the universe might have been like when the energies were so high, just moments after the Big Bang. So that's their that's their goal to kind of reach uh, a stage Those where energies. you can sort of start analyzing what the universe might have been a few fractions of a second after the Big Bang and things like that. Yeah. What do you think it's like um, at the LHC now, now that they've um, really, they, the experiments have started? So they you can't go in anymore because uh, no. it's, uh, they will not let you anywhere near, uh, b- oh, because it's, there's, there's, uh, they're, it, and it's just, cold. They've, they've, the, the whole, the, yeah, the whole yeah, ring the, is, exactly. is So the cold. ring is cold. The ring is at 1.9 Kelvin, which is uh, literally the coldest ring in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, there's, there'll also be radiation that uh, you don't want to be near uh, mm-hmm. the functioning detector and the experiment. So they won't let you, uh, you can only be behind uh, very thick concrete walls and things like that. So all these control rooms are protected. They're all very well protected. So so there's probably a different, um, the culture of the of the LHC is probably changing as a result of the the change from being constructed under construction to actually going into experimentation. I would imagine so. I think the people building them, they, you know, again, these are the kind of people who have spent 15, 20 years working on one experiment that is yeah. just about starting up and it's going to take at least a few more years before they start seeing results. So I'm sure the expectation now of getting results is there and they, they must be much more optimistic than they would have been a few years ago. Yeah. Is there any place that you haven't been yet in terms of experiments that are going on that you've found out about, about since you know going on these initial trips for this particular book? Is there any place else that you're learning of that you want to go to that would be you know this experiment? Oh, I want to see it happening. <laughs> um, yes, there there is a neutrino telescope. There are a few neutrino telescopes being built in the Mediterranean Sea. Oh. So they're essentially just like the Lake Baikal neutrino telescope. They're building neutrino telescopes that are using the Mediterranean Sea itself as a detector. So they are putting these telescopes. Which would be a wonderful vacation yes. destination. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so that would be beautiful to go to and, and see what they're doing. It's much more, yeah. it's very sophisticated. These are very big telescopes that they're building. And unlike in Lake Baikal, where they use the ice as a platform and, and have their ice camp on top of the ice, in the Mediterranean, you know, the sea doesn't freeze. Right. So they need. Uh, really very uh, sophisticated ships and submersibles and so it's a completely different s- scale of operation which, which they can probably get from the from the oil industry Why? so if they probably i don't know where they're getting it from <laughs> but, uh, you probably. want if you if you want ships that that can handle that kind yeah, of yeah. that kind of a you know stable make Platforms. a stable platform where you yeah. can do work that you can you know probably access I stuff i should check that out yeah i imagine so, but that's one place and there are a few giant telescopes that are beginning to be built, the next generation of telescopes, also in Chile, but different parts of Chile compared to where I went, mm-hmm. uh, which I would I think, lo- love to go back to and see them. Well, we're getting uh, towards the end of, the, of, our, of our hour, but do you have um, any other books on the way? Are you focusing on New Scientist magazine? Are you, you know, s- maintaining your interest in in learning about physics and writing about physics or are you spreading out? And I'm, well, in terms of writing for New Scientist, uh, I've always uh, sort of spread out. I've mm-hmm. tried to write about physics, but also about neuroscience and I know, climate I've, change. And I've been reading your work for years, <laughs> oh. so this is, I'm excited. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, but I, I definitely am keeping in touch with uh, the physics experiments that the ones I vis- visited, I want to keep up and keep readers up to date with the blog. So yeah. I've been just keeping it. Uh, an eye out for results that might be coming out and it's just nice to keep in touch with these scientists and the people I met. And if anybody is interested in taking a look at the Edge of Physics blog, the Edge of Physics, uh, here are some of the, uh, it's at theedgeofphysics.com forward slash blog. Fairly yeah. straightforward there. Um, and you can find the book and you can also find some of these stories, the updates on some of these uh, experiments that that Anil was just mentioning. I think this is, yeah, this is, it just seems like this was a fabulous, fascinating exploration um, and a project to get into. I mean, are you, do you feel any, um, I don't know, 
you, you said that there were there were possibly tears at leaving South the South Pole. But do you feel um, like you are ready to embark on a new adventure, or are you you feel sadness that you know the book and the book uh, <laughs> is, out. is out? You know, this it's done. The the closing chapter of this part of your I life. I'm, I'm, I think I'm still learning to let go of this book it hasn't uh, i'm not yet ready to go on to the next project this still means uh, a lot to me so i'm i think it'll take me a few months before i can wean myself away from this project yeah it just it seems like like all this stuff that you've that the stories that you've that you've told this would make somebody mentioned it in the in the chat room just a little while ago that this would make an amazing tv series that this was you know a nova special or you know to follow you know follow the adventurer to the different places and the, to the corners of the earth. Yeah, but TV works very differently. So I have, there have been people who've said they were interested, but mm -hmm. they, they work on very different time scales. So I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> but you're, you're right. I think it would be a wonderful special. It would be, yeah, it would be, it would just be amazing. It'd be, because it's one thing to, to read something, but to see it yourself, you know, you, you have a, an image in your mind's eye when you, when you read a book and you yeah. create a world for yourself from the world, the words that an author writes down. Um, and then to actually see it, yeah. you know, to get that much closer to actually experiencing it yourself. Is that something that you, um, that you enjoy about writing and writing about science? Do you, is, is yes, very much so. I think, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, this particular set of experiments that I went to and, and saw, I really wanted to communicate the wonder of science to the readers. And uh, I couldn't think of a better way than to actually talk about this extreme stuff and somehow use that to convey just how amazing science can be and, uh, yeah. and is. And, uh, and is. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you have any other, any closing comments, a take home story for our listeners? Take home message? Um, other than buy your book buy, buy my book. <laughs> um, prob probably the thing that I closed my book with which is that I, I very strongly felt by the end of the journeys that I think we have to protect these remote regions uh, mm -hmm. from pollution and obviously from climate change and things like that because if we lose these pristine environments I think we're going to be left with no place where we can go to to do these kind of experiments and we'll essentially become you know I was thinking of the analogy with the, with the monks you know, if, imagine if the monks could never find silence and solitude mm -hmm. they wouldn't be able to then look deep into their own selves to ask the questions that they do and in a sense this is analogous to that where if we end up with a planet that is noisy and that's, there's no place where we can go for silence for the experiments we will not be able to look further back in time or deeper into space and understand our own origins. And to me, that would be a big tragedy. So in a sense, uh, after traveling all over, I think that was the, the sort of deepest conclusion that I could come to, that we really need to save these places and make sure that they are protected. And this is Anil Ananthaswamy from New Scientist magazine. He's written The Edge of Physics. A journey to Earth's extremes to unlock the secrets of the universe. You can find it at theedgeofphysics.com. Um, and like I mentioned in the previous show, you can find it at audible.com. It is available as an audiobook. So while you're adventuring, you can listen to Anil's adventures in physics. I'd like to, uh, to take... This moment to thank you very much for joining me on the show. It was just fabulous to talk with you about all this. It sounds, I, I want to keep talking. This well, is great. So many adventures. Thank you, Kiki. It was my pleasure to be on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for driving to Petaluma. It was, it's As good. I said, it was a wonderful drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to thank everyone for watching. This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki. And again, if you'd like to, any more information on this, you can find the book at theedgeofphysics.com. Um, on next week's show, on the next show, we're going to be talking not about the culture of Amazonian tribes or the extremes of journeying to find physics. We're going to be talking about whales. That's right. We're talking about whales. And until then, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on Twitter at Dr. Kiki or on my Facebook fan page, which I don't know the um, 
web address for it. It's a little bit too long for me to remember. And you can subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour on iTunes, or you can find past episodes at twit.tv forward slash Kiki. And if you need more sciencey goodness, you can find it at thisweekinscience.com, which can be found at twist.org. And which will soon be found, I'm going to announce it now, starting Monday, April 13th, 8 p.m. every Monday here on the Twit Network. This Week in Science will be broadcasting live weekly from This Week in Tech. Um, and you can check out the This Week in Science book club at Twist bookclub.ning.com and we're reading Collider, so Extreme Physics. Once again, we're reading Collider by Paul Halpern this month of April. I will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to my Science Hour and remember, all I ask you for is just one hour a week. Well, maybe two sometimes, but one hour a week. And all it takes is one hour a week to make your world a lot more interesting.